Welcome everyone. And this is a history of people and the great swamp, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So you'll notice as we go along when it's good, when it's bad, and when it's truly ugly. So this is a map of the uh, great swamp from about 19, from 19, uh, 1893. And it shows you Long Hill down there at the diagonal across the bottom. And you can see the um, Passaic River to over there on the left, draining out at the bottom left through the Millington Gap. And notice that all of those streams are coming down from the north, that um, they're moving through the swamp, emptying into the Passaic River and then out. So it's very obvious that this is a slow but perpetually moving body of water. It was never meant to be stagnant. And we need to, we will keep that in mind as we look at the history of the Great Swamp. So we have about 1400 years of human history. I'm trying to adjust at home, they're, seeing, they're not seeing it right. Okay. Yep. Technical matter. Yeah. We're good now? Yes. Okie dokie. All right. So in order to understand the human history of the swamp, we need to also understand how the swamp was created in the first place. And as most of you know, we had three glacial incursions in Northern New Jersey, the last one being the Wisconsin Glacier you see up there. And it melted, as it melted about 23,000 years ago, it formed glacial Lake Passaic. And you can see, as I was saying, we had three incursions of the glacier come in. And as it melted, it created this huge glacial lake. And you can see the size of the thing. It was enormous. And the two gray lines you see there down on the southeast, those are the first and second Wachung ranges. The line you see to the inside of that that's labeled Long Hill, that's the third Wachung mountain range. And you can see that it was just an island in the middle of this great big swamp. And it's 200 to 300 feet high. So you can imagine how deep this lake was when it existed. Now it partially emptied and filled and partially emptied and filled three times. And the last time it emptied, it emptied through the Millington Gap. So as that swamp disappeared and, or sorry, as the lake disappeared, um, then we get, uh, okay, let's look at the um, bedrock of the Great Swamp, and it's gonna be right there. You see the brown lines, those three brown lines on the, the Southeast, those are the Wachongs, and tucked right inside Long Hill is the Great Swamp, above that purple line that showed one of the glacial incursions. Now the brown, that is all created as a Jurassic basalt. This was lava at one point. So believe it or not, New Jersey was a bunch of volcanoes. And eventually this lava was uplifted and that's what formed the Wachung Mountains. And that's why Long Hill holds in the Great Swamp. But the green area you're seeing there is Jurassic siltstone and shale, which is pretty non-porous. Then the sandstone and conglomerate, this has a variable permeability depending on particle size. Well, the particle size that's under us in the Great Swamp is fairly small. So that means that was pretty non-permeable too. So the water in the Great Swamp is not going to percolate down. It has to flow out. I can't get the cursor. There it is. Nope. 
Okay, now this map shows us the surficial geology, and that means it's the stuff on top of the bedrock. And look at the middle of the slide, and you see the lavender and turquoise area there. That's the Great Swamp. And part of it, the turquoise, is freshwater wetland deposit. This is the soil that came when the glacier was melting and the rivers come out from underneath it. And surprisingly, an awful lot of glacial melting happens underneath, not just on top. So all of the um, turquoise you see there came from out from underneath the glacier. Then we have Great Lake Passaic. And during the time it existed, the particle matter in the lake precipitated out and formed lake clay, which is the lavender part of it. So we've got a lot of clay under it. And this will show up when we get to uh, the human effects on the swamp. So let's look at the pre-colonial period. This was good for the swamp and good for the people who were involved with it. And this is gonna be one of the few times that actually happens. So as the great swamp I'm sorry, as the uh, glacial lake disappeared, there were already humans in this area. And when the swamp was created, it was a terrific place to live next to because it was like living next to a big box store. So from about 12,000 or 14,000 years ago, we start seeing the paleo Indians in this area. And we have uh, archeological proof of their existence from archeological digs around the Great Swamp, including one that was at the end of Britain Road. I think it was in the 1980s. And we're still hoping from the museum to get the uh, artifacts from that dig. So we're not really sure when the Lenape became a distinct tribe and developed their own language, but they've been here for a really long time. And we have proof of their existence because almost all of the farm fields around the Great Swamp produce um, spearheads and arrowheads and uh, scrapers, ax heads, stone, all sorts of shaped stones that were made by the Lenape. And we have a nice collection of them in the uh, Red River Schoolhouse Museum Township. And they were all found within a mile of the the red brick schoolhouse. So they were everywhere, everywhere, and people still find them. Now, the Lenape also saw the Great Swamp as a big box store. Everything they needed to um, make their shelters, to eat, to drink, it was all right there. And the shelters that they made were made out of um, saplings that were driven into the ground, top and bottom. And then over those in the winter, they laid bark. And in the summer, they laid mo woven maps that were ma mats that were made out of grasses from the Great Swamp. And they lived in villages of several hogans that you see here. And they planted the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. Now, the corn was first um, planted in a little hillock. And once it came up, they would plant the beans around it and the beans would use the corn stalk as a bean pole. And the squash was then planted. And as its vine spread out, those big leaves protected the soil from drying out. And because it was shady, the weeds were discouraged from growing. So it was a great system and it was used all across uh, the Americas. Now, because corn sucks a lot of nutrition out of, the so out of the soil, the village would have to move about every six or eight years because the soil was worn out. They'd move to another section beyond, uh, around the swamp and leave that land to regenerate itself. One of the other things the swamp provided for them was clay. And you can see the lady on the left there 
making a, a clay snake that she would then use to create the coiled vessels that they use. They would dry them in the sun and then finish them in fire pits. Now we get to the colonial period and we can see it was good for some people, not so good for others, and not so good for the Great Swamp. The Lenape were pushed off the land and in uh, 1708, 30,000 acres of land were um, sold by the Lenape, I'm sorry, Lenape, for the purchase price of 15 kettles, four pistols, four cutlasses, some rum, and some cash. And they discovered later what sale actually meant. It meant you were supposed to leave and uh, leave the land to the people you sold it to. Well, the trails that the Lenapes had used to get into and across the swamp became the logging roads of the colonists. And they are our roads today. So when you drive down Pleasant Plains Road or Long Hill Road, you're actually driving down an ancient Indian pathway. Now, an important thing to point out was the um, tulip poplars that we still have around here today. Those were really coveted beginning right when the colonists got here and all the way up through the sailing ships period because these made great masts. They were very tall. They had no lower branches until you got really high. And there was a good balance between their strength and their ability to give a little bit. This is the type of farmhouse that would have been built around the Great Swamp and uh, later in the Great Swamp. The one you see on the left is the Bachhoven Cottage. This was the first place that the Bachhovens lived when they moved to this area. And they were here for quite some time, for several generations. And the farmhouse that we're standing in now was, was, was uh, owned by the Bachhovens. This house was here on the property when the Bachhovens sold the land to the refuge. But the um, Fish and Wildlife did not feel that they had the funds to um, renovate this so it was taken down. But this is an, what's called an Eastersy cottage. And you would see other, uh, others of them around the swamp. My sister and I live in one that was built about 250 years ago. And these were built between about 1760, right up into the middle of the 1800s. And they're, they were very useful house. They were a story and a half high, as you can see. And they were usually three bays to start with. Often two more bays were added on. So you had a bigger house as you got the money to do that. And you can see the large chimney on the side of the house. And what was unusual about this was it actually fed two fireplaces, one in the parlor. And then there would be one that was for in the kitchen that was for cooking and keeping you warm. Excuse me a minute. When the colonists first got to the United to the to the Americas, they came with axes that were being used on the forests of Europe. The great um, old stands of trees were all gone in Europe, except some in the Royal Forest. So no old growth trees. When they got to the Americas they saw these enormous trees that they had never seen before. Well, their axes were not built to work with these trees. They were poorly balanced. The, the blades were too long. The blades were too narrow. And if you look at where the eye is, that's where the um, handle goes up through it. On the English felling ax, you see it has a very distinct cheek. It comes in very sharply. So you can imagine when that goes into a tree and it hits that cheek, it stops pretty suddenly and hasn't been cutting any more than that. But when you smooth the cheek out, as you see with the American felling blade, you get a good smooth follow through. It's not as, as jarring. The other thing that happened with the American felling blade was the blade was shortened, it was broadened, and behind the eye, you had the pole butt. 
you put a heavy weight at the back of it so it balances it better and more of the force of the cut is coming from the ax than from the woodsman. So it made it a lot easier for the, uh, the woodsman to come in and cut down all the trees. So it was great for the woodsman, not so great for the trees. Now, as you saw on the introductory slide to this period, there was a lot of charcoal making. And the reason they need the, needed this charcoal was because there were a lot of iron forges in the area, as well as blacksmith forges. And you have to have charcoal to create enough heat to melt iron. So there was a lot of charcoal burning in the swamp. And this was pretty hard on the Great Swamp because these mounds would consist of 50 to 90 cords of hard, seasoned hardwood, enormous amounts. And each cord only produced about 700 pounds of charcoal. And a lot of charcoal was needed, especially for the iron forges. Revolutionary War comes along. It's good for the Patriots, not so good for the Loyalists and the Brits, and we'll see why. And it certainly was not so good for the swamp because you've now got a whole lot more people dependent on the wood and food that was coming from the Great Swamp. However, it was really good for the British Army. It was really good for the Continental Army because of the geology of the place. At the top the, there, you see Morristown, and below that you see the Great Swamp, and then Long Hill is labeled there. So we've got these two big barriers from the that's protecting the South. And this was good because British were wintering over down in New Brunswick. To the east, you have all three ranges of the Wachung Mountains, and that is protecting you from the British in New York City and on Staten Island. The only way they could get through those Wachungs was through the Hobart Gap, and we know it now is a pretty big piece of, of opening because it's got all that highway going through. It was really narrow back then. So British troops thought maybe they could get through it, but they never got anywhere near it. So Washington used this place twice, from January to May of 77, and from December of 79 to June of 80. And it was a very effective barricade to live behind. Now, he probably knew about it, because of one of his generals, William Alexander, who styled himself Lord Sterling, he owned all of the Great Swamp at that time. And he had a house, which was then considered a mansion, where the Somerset County uh, Environmental Education Center is now. His house was very close to that. And he actually lost all of his lands in the Great Swamp um, due to bankruptcy. He was not a good manager of his money. Post-revolution, good for the people, getting worse and worse for the Great Swamp because we have more people who need land, more people who need houses, and more outbuildings. So we still see all of this mil mil um, lumber being used for the same purposes that we saw before. This is a fantastic map. This is by John Littell, and he drew this in 1845. And it is something that any researcher or historian, their, their heart just starts pumping fast when they see this because he drew all of the property borders and then he put the names inside them. So you knew who lived where in 1845. And the Great Swamp, you can see right across the middle, is the Long Hill. That's the blue line. And above that, just past that blue line where Great, where uh, Long Hill drops off, you see the Great Swamp, which stretches all the way to the top of the map. And I have highlighted with red all of the spots that John Littell said there were farmhouses. We're at 1845. Look at how many people are living in the Great Swamp already. They only live there because they can farm there. 
So we're looking at a lot of empty land. And the only way they could keep this land uh, arable was to keep it drained with dikes and ditches. Now, this is one section of the map over by Green Village. Green Village is right at the top and Southern Boulevard of Chatham Township is off to the right hand side. And you see that grid work. This is a real good example of woodlots. And there were lots and lots and lots of woodlots in the Great Swamp. And you can see lots of other little pieces of land drawn out there. These woodlots belong to people who had homes in the towns. They had to have a source of wood for their heat and cooking. And that was in the Great Swamp. So if you sold your house, you sold your woodlot along with it. And this was your wood. You took care of this woodlot because it had to provide you with wood for a long time. Because at that point, we didn't foresee there would be other methods for heating the home and cooking. So let's look at how wood was um, processed. When we first get to America, it's still being processed. The, the, the uh, timber is being trimmed down using a two-man saw and a pit sawmill. And you know the guy in the bottom here was the lowest of the low, literally. He was the newest guy, the lowest in seniority, because you can imagine what he looked like when he climbed out of that pit. He would have been absolutely covered with sawdust. And you can imagine doing this in the, in the summer when you're sweaty too. Well, when the Europeans got to America, they found all these streams and rivers and they realized that they could harness them for water power. And they didn't have to be flowing very fast or down a particularly steep grade because you could build a dam even across a small stream and back up the water and then build a mill race coming off of it and you aim that at your water wheel. And now you had a lot of power. And you can see on the right hand image, the water wheel down there on the right and the gears are running what we still have the equivalent of a two man saw. We don't yet have the big um, uh, circular saws because they didn't have forges that could produce that kind of um, tool yet. Plus, when we finally do get those, water power is not gonna be strong enough to push them. So Littell shows us a, a sawmill and it actually says sawmill at the bottom of what looks like a bladder. That is actually Osborne Pond. And you know it today, it's right down the road from us here. And the first guy to run it, oh, and let me point out the um, blue triangle is the visitor center where we are. And the uh, red triangle is right where the overlook is, where we spend every Friday. <laughs> so Osborne Pond was not originally uh, created by Osborne. It was created by Mr. Dickey. And he was the first one. We don't know quite when this occurred. I'm st still researching that. Then he sold it to one of the Baird family. And there were a lot of Bairds around here. Mr. Osborne finally was the one who owned it and his name stuck. James Baird then pre, um, uh, purchased it and he made it into a pumping station to provide Basking Ridge with drinking water. And finally the Basking Ridge Water Works um, took that over. You can see in the distance there a house mm -hmm. on the curve around Osborne Pond that still exists, one of the Baird houses. So here's Samuel, Samuel Roberts Mill. This is just north of the Green Village Green. And it was created, it's actually the second mill on Black Brook. Great Brook, correct myself, Great Brook. So Great Brook, Brook is first dammed just on the other side of Blue Mill Road to create Silver Lake. And that ran first a forge and then a grist mill. Then you cross 
um, Blue Mill Road and come down what is now Dixon's Mill Road. And now Great Brook runs through that meadow. Well, that meadow used to be a mill pond, the whole thing. And just before it got to the end of Dixon's Mill Road was where Samuel Miller built his dam. And you can see it to the right in the middle of the image. There's the dam. And he had a mill stream running off of that to run his sawmill. Now, his mill was run primarily by slave labor. And at some point in time, he had up to 11 enslaved people that were working for him or were members of the family. Then when the wood was really getting spares coming out of the great swamp, he switched his sawmill to a cider mill, taking advantage of all of the orchards that were around here at that point. And his sawmill was built in about 1800. So as I said, we finally reached a point in about the 1840s, 1850s, where we could produce these great big saw blades. And we had steam engines that could were powerful enough to run the things. The problem was both of them could be made portable. So now you take the whole thing into the woods and you can process this stuff much faster. It's easier to get it out. You don't have to haul these enormous logs out. So this is really bad news for the forest. It's spelled doom for a lot of forests across the United States. Let's look at the mid 1800s to the mid 1900s. This was good for the people, getting even worse for the Great Swamp because we've got more continued growth. But the good lumber that could be used for building houses is running low. It's, it's almost gone for the swamp. They can still make railroad ties, shingles, clapboards, farm equipment. It's still being used for heating and cooking until about the turn of that century when coal starts being used. And now you have these nice cast iron stoves that you can use the coal in. But the forests around us are close to being depleted. One of the, the almost last sawmills that were around the Great Swamp, this one was in Green Village, and this is William DeMott's sawmill. And he also, on the second story there, made peach baskets by the thousands. There were a lot of peach orchards in New Jersey at the time. And uh, his peach baskets not only went locally and around the state, they also went south down to the peach orchards further um, down in the southern United States. And he, he was uh, in work until about 1928 when he retired and closed the uh, whole factory down. And about a year or two later, it burned down probably as a result of arson. This is a, an image of a map, Beer's map from 1868. Now remember what Littell's map looked like in, in uh, 1845. You can kind of see all of the names plotted out there on this map. Well, there are definitely more than there were in uh, 45. And the, the hamlets around the swamp, these are much bigger now. And you can see Logansville there. You drove through Logansville to get here. Those houses along Lees Hill Road actually were a hamlet. That was a real village at the time. And uh, there were several others around there, Pleasantville, Green Village, um, Myersville and Whitebridge. Well, there were these farms, they had big families. So you had to have schools that were close enough that little kids could walk to them because that's the way kids had to get to school. So the red arrows that you're, you're seeing there marking schools. So there was one in Logansville, one in Pleasantville, the one in Green Village still exists, so you wouldn't recognize it. It is now the Green Village Deli. Yeah. And there was one just down um, below the where I cut the map off in Myersville. And the, the one, the uh, arrow that you see just above that 
That was at the intersection of White Bridge Road and Pleasant Plains Road. And that school still exists. It's the one, the building on the left here. So it was built before 1868, and here it is in 1900. All of these schools were one-room schools, a single, a single teacher, and eight grades. And uh, this school was also referred to as the Swamp School because it was truly in the swamp. And it still stands. The house is still there. The building is still there, and it's a private home now. Across the street from it, was the Pleasant Plains Methodist Episcopal Church. And it is no longer there, but apparently its foundation still is. This is a view from, if you're standing with your back to the south and looking across Myersville, the village of Myersville, across the swamp. And this is in 1906. And you can see how devoid the swamp is of trees. It's really open. And we have um, an autobiography of a man who was living in this swamp as a, as a kid and an adult. And he said they could sit on their front porch and see a carriage coming in the evening with its lights on more than a mile away. And you didn't used to be able to do that because of all of the trees. Now, with all these trees gone, there is going to be a flooding problem downstream in the Passaic because those trees normally suck up huge amounts of water and hold on to it long enough that it slows down the uh, water that's dumped into the Passaic River. The last sawmill in or around the Great Swamp was owned by the Zander family. And it was located on the part of Myersville Road that no longer exists. It is now just a path through the wilderness section. And it was run by the Zanders. And it was two generations that ran that saw. And at first it was a water mill that ran it. And you can see there's a brook running close by where the arrow is. And then it became a steam driven um, mill because he's got the big blade there. And the, um, the Zanders sold the land to the Great Swamp in 1968, just as the swamp was becoming a wilderness in that area. So his land became part of that. Now, this is, we're kind of going back in time a little bit here. This is part of the Forests of Northern New Jersey map, and I've homed in just on the Great Swamp. So the whole Great Swamp there is um, within the picture. And the white areas are open land. So this is the part of the Great Swamp that is pasture land and um, grain crops. Then you see the um, black and gray area that is fresh meadow and swamp land. So this is swamp or kind of damp land. And there's one grain crop that, you, well, there are actually two, rice, but we're not growing rice up here. There's only one grain crop that you can really grow in pretty wet land, and that is lowland hay. And it can tolerate pretty moist soil. And that was probably the number one product that was coming out of the Great Swamp. And it doesn't get you a lot of money. So you find that by the 40s and 50s, almost all the houses that are in the swamp are lived in by non-farmers. So the farming did not pay terribly well for most people. However, part of the swamp that had been drained, particularly over by Green Village and Chatham Township, it supported peach trees just fine. Remember, you had to maintain that dry land with dikes and ditches. And uh, two of the fairly wealthy families that were in Chatham Township at the time, the Noes and the Brant got together. And Louis Snowy and two of his brothers-in-law, Oscar and Samuel Brant, started um, peach tree business. And they had a large number of peach trees, many of them 
in the great swamp being tended by tenant farmers. And uh, Louis Noe became known nationally for his ability to grow peaches and develop his own peach varieties, which had to be um, uh, what do you grafted on to other peach trees. And he had a pretty good business. He and the, his uh, brothers-in-law had a pretty good business with this. So Noe's known all across the country for his expertise. So he learns pretty early on when the peach blight arrives in California from China. And uh, he sells his part of the business to his brothers-in-law. <laughs> well, we don't know if they knew anything about the blight or not, but they bought his part of it. And uh, certainly Samuel did pretty well because we see him in 1916 and 1925 advertising his fruit in the um, Chatham press. And this was past the time when the uh, blight came through and really decimated the peach and plum trees all across New Jersey. Now, here we have on this uh, 1853 map, I came across this marked by the red arrow, Baird Brickyard. There are the Bairds again. And so we know that bricks were made right here in the swamp. And what do you need to make bricks? Clay, yes. And we know we've got lots of clay here. I don't know yet where exactly he got the clay from in the swamp, but we know that the bricks were made and fired here on part of the Bachhoven land. So probably easily within sight of where we are now. Now we know that the brickyard was here at least in, uh, where'd I go? I think it was in 37, yes, in up uh, 39, because these bricks were used to build the uh, Basking Ridge Presbyterian Church that still stands there on their green. And uh, all those bricks came from right here. Now, remember the lake clay, it's pointed out here again. Well, it wasn't just used for making bricks. A gentleman named um, Amzi Leonard, and there were a lot of Leonards in the swamp too, he started a pottery. And it's right over here. If you, if you go out here on Wood Duck Lane and take a left, you'll right away see Bailey's Mill Road, that road with the triangle. Well, his business was right past that. And the articles that I've read about him said that he dug his clay around that area. But again, I'm still not certain exactly where he got it from. But he made um, his primary uh, product was drain tile, the pipes that you use to keep the swamp and other places like this dry. When he sold the business, it ended up with Eugene Hoffman and his son, Perry, who installed modern machinery and then started making flower pots of all sizes and kinds for the nursery business. Have a good and day. They, cl they closed the business around uh, 1957. Okay, let's look at the Great Swamp when it was considered worthless land. And it was for a lot of the time. There was a period of time when it was considered an excellent place to build a reservoir. So you would eliminate the, the flooding downstream. You could control how much water left at any given time. And you could also control those nasty mosquitoes. Now, I always find it really interesting that people move next to a swamp or onto a floodplain, note flood plain, and then wonder why they're getting bitten by mosquitoes and flooded out. And they expect it to just stop. Well, as we know, it doesn't. So luckily, even though um, this idea of creating the reservoir uh, came along as early as the 1880s, it never came to fruition. 
Well, the alternate plan, starting as early as the 1890s, was that the swamp could be drained. Now, obviously, they had no idea about the hydrology of this area, as we saw on the first maps I showed you, that there was no way that the Great Swamp watershed was going to stop pushing all of this water down into the Great Swamp. So needless to say, this never came to fruition either. But there was a better plan that came along, and this was in 1933 to 1934 with FDR's Civilian Conservation Corps and Civilian Works Administration. And you can see some of the ditch diggers here. And for three years, there were various projects that involved the Great Swamp and the Passaic River. They did all the work by hand, even though there were machines that could do it because they wanted men to be employed. So at one point there were 200 CCC workers, mostly World War veterans, deepening the Passaic River and improving drainage of the tributaries in the swamp, meaning our brooks. Then there were 560 CWA men who widened Myersville Road, lowered the Pacific River uh, bed, improved the drainage ditches within the Great Swamp, and actually straightened Black Brook. In 1945, the Morris County Mosquito Commission again did ditch cleaning, and uh, they were they cleaned out the fallen log, fallen trees, and the debris from the Passaic River. And on a current hydrology map, and you can just I hope you can see the blue lines in there. The very straight one that's in the middle of the map on the far right, that's the very straight Black Brook that still exists today that was straightened out in the 1930s. Let's look at the white, uh, at the Great Swamp as wilderness. And it was considered wilderness by many people uh, long before it was officially a wilderness. And as long as there were skates and a frozen swamp, the kids were out there skating. You cannot imagine a better skating rink than this. You're talking about you know, 8,000 acres of land that you could skate on. Oops. Then since the time the Neo um, Indians, I'm sorry, the uh, Paleo Indians showed up, there has been hunting in this swamp. And the uh, Indians understood that you didn't take more than was required to regenerate what was there. They understood that concept because they lived within nature. When we stopped living within nature, we stopped realizing that this was not an unending source. So by the 1900s, there were virtually no deer left in New Jersey. They had been hunted nearly to extinction. From 1902 to 1909, there was no hunting season in New Jersey. From 1902 to 1913, they actually restocked the state by importing deer from Pennsylvania and Michigan. Of course, during this time, there was also hunting of game birds, squirrels, uh, rabbits, uh, raccoons, turkeys. Turkeys were another thing that were hunted to extinction in the Great Swamp and had to be re uh, reintroduced. The other thing that was hunted in the swamp were blueberries. And even today, we see these blueberry bushes. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, Christmas greens. The um, mountain laurel, and the holly. The holly was being harvested nearly to extinction. So although there was no law that said you can't harvest it anymore, real pleas went out from the public to not do that. And it used to be that scouts would go in and harvest it and sell it to raise money. And they stopped doing it because it was um, decimating the swamp of it. Now, as soon as you get people out hunting in the swamp, regardless of what they're hunting for, they start to get lost. 
And you see this as soon as you start typing in Great Swamp into newspapers.com, you get one lost soul after another, after another. Sometimes only for hours, sometimes for several days. A couple weren't found until their bodies were discovered by hunters a long time later. We also always had people who loved birds. They were always out there. And Grace and James Hand, who first lived in Summit and then moved to Green Village so they could be closer to the swamp, they, were, they belonged to the uh, Audubon Society. And for many years, they gave tours and bird walks within the swamp. And they both became involved in saving the great swamp when it was threatened by the jet port. Now, this is a story I have, to, I have to include, even though I'm not talking that much about individuals. This is Charles Rummel. He was a German immigrant who lived in Green Village and he was a self-educated lepidopterist. And he loved to teach kids about moths and butterflies. So <laughs> he would take them to the swamp and teach them. And you can see him here doing some of his research. Well, two of the kids that he introduced to moths and butterflies were Lincoln Brower and Jane Van Zandt of Chatham Township. Both of them eventually got PhDs in entomology. They're mar they married and later divorced, but Lincoln became one of the foremost researchers in monarch butterflies. Wow. And especially in their migration and the effects of their coloration. So we can thank Charles Rummel and the Great Swamp for the knowledge that we have of them today. And when Lincoln Brower died, his son Andy um, wrote a letter to one of the uh, lepidoptery um, journals. And in his letter, he remarked on Charles Rummel being Lincoln's uh, mentor. And he said about Charles Rummel, he had a penchant for building ingenious gadgets, including an air pump to blow up caterpillars, beautifully crafted pinning boards, and a trigger and trap door killing jar lid that allowed a person to catch the moth one-handed when it normally took three hands. Now, kids of that era, probably from as soon as kids settled in this area up into probably about the 1980s. The boys loved the great swamp. They became swamp rats. And the girls, as Mrs. Fenske's daughter called them bog hoppers, spent the whole weekend in the swamp. In the summer, that's where they were. Their families knew they weren't getting into trouble. They were in the swamp. Now, one of my brothers, when he was quite young, um, and we lived right across from the swamp, he brought home a tree frog and put it in his terrarium. Well, at four o'clock in the morning, the thing starts to call. Well, the family arose and informed him that he was taking it back to the swamp now. He didn't even get to change out of his pajamas. <laughs> okay. This? All right, now. The dumbest, ugliest idea ever. You know what it is. Yeah. The jet port. The jet port. So take a look at the map here. The dotted line, the heavy dotted line, shows you where the airport was supposed to be. The heavy straight lines. Um, I think somebody is not... Um, muted, could you mute your computers, please, at home? The heavy black lines show the runways, and those black cones are the landing and takeoff cones. Patterns. Yeah, New Vernon, Bernardsville, Myersville. Could, it, could everyone please make sure that their uh, computers are muted, please? We're, we're hearing talk. Okay, now, took Scott Morris more than an hour to tell you this story, and it took Cab Cam Cavanaugh an entire book. Both of them are terrific, and if you haven't watched and read them, you need to do that. 
Scott Morris's film can be found on Amazon. You can rent it for the night for four bucks. Pam Cavanaugh's book is out of print. It's really hard to find, and we're not going to admit to how many copies we have. But if you can, you may be able to find them in your local library. Okay, so I don't have all that time to tell you this story, so I'm going to give it to you short and fast. So give me a minute here. Okay, here we go. In December of 1959, a representative of the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, was not part of the label yet, contacted the Newark Evening News concerning a plan to build a jet port in the Great Swamp. The rep made it clear that the newspaper was expected to make this plan look like a good idea. Now, the editor wasn't so sure it was a really good idea, but he knew a good story when he saw one. So he plastered it across the front page atop of the, uh, of the fold. North Jersey, not to mention the locals, freaked out. Backlash was immediate. With one, within one week, there was a meeting at Madison High School that had an overflow audience. The audience learned that Austin Tobin, this is the villain of the piece, Austin Tobin intended to take one uh, 10,000 acres of Great Swamp by eminent domain, and Austin Tobin was good at eminent domain. It would obliterate Green Village, Myersville, New Vernon Village, parts of Chatham Township, Basking Ridge, and Madison. These early jets were so loud and, and polluting that they would make life for, miserable for everyone else who was left. The jet port would include four runways, each 12,000 feet long to, to accommodate the jets. Ooh. The 200 to 400 foot high long hill would be knocked down and pushed into the swamp to fill it in so the jet port could be built. The new jets were so polluting when burning fuel during takeoff that it was recommended that the nearest town be not closer than five miles away. But Port Authority only had authority over a 25 mile radius around the Statue of Liberty while Great Swamp was at mile number 26. Oh, so the state legislature and governors of both the states of New York and New Jersey had to agree to the change in, in regional authority. Most of New Jer Jersey's legislators were against the plan, but Governor Meyer of New Jersey, Minor of New Jersey, said he was non-committal. Austin Tobin was unconcerned because he said, I always win. Jersey Jetport Site Association was created and headed by Representative Peter Freelingheisen, one of our heroes. Its purpose was to convince local, state, and, no, and uh, federal politicians to fight the plan. Peter Freelingheisen, Austin Hope, Tobin was not afraid. He counted on public apathy and a drop in interest following the first burst of jet port opposition. So the New Jersey State Legislature passed a resolution to oppose the jet port in Morris County. Austin Tobin shrugged. He had never been beaten. The JSSA convinced U.S. Congressman Emanuel Seller of New York to encourage the U.S. Congress to examine the New York Port Authority's policy procedures and integrity. Austin Tobin refused to provide Congress with the requested documents, and he was indicted for contempt of, of Congress. Meanwhile, Marcellus Hartley Dodge, a lifelong conservationist, had quietly been buying up a thousand acres of land in the swamp, piecemeal and in strategic places. In September of 1960, he donated the land to the U.S. Department of the Interior for a wildlife sanctuary because Marcy Dodge knew that the PA could not condemn federal lands. At the same time, expert consultant reports commissioned by Harding Township, Chatham, and the Morris County found that no jet port was needed. The PA analysis was wrong. Austin Tobin ignored them. In 1961, the Great Swamp Committee of the North American Wildlife Federation was created and Helen Fenske, another one of our heroes, was executive secretary and Marcy Dodge was the honorary director. The group became expert at educating the public about the value and, and richness of the Great Swamp. Grace Hand and Swampy Joe Lloyd became polished presenters and gave tours of the Great Swamp. Helen Fency became a master of working the phones. The New York, the New Jersey legislature passed a law prohibiting building of a jet port for interstate or international uses in seven counties in New Jersey, including Morris. Non-committed Governor Minor 
vetoed the bill, finally admitting that he was pro-jet port. Soon after, the regional director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, John Gottschalk, told the Great Swamp Committee that 2,000, of acre, 2000 acres would be enough to get active management in the Great Swamp. 3,000 would be needed to guarantee the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. So Great Swamp Committee and others already had enough money to buy another 1,000 acres to add to Dodges. And in 1961, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife opened an office here in the Great Swamp. Still needed 900 acres of land to get to the 3,000 requirement. Well, soon Udall became the Secretary of the Interior under JFK in 1961. And in 1963, he published his book, The Quiet Crisis, about how America's rich national, natural resources were at serious risk. And it acted as a stimulant to the public to save the Great Swamp and the money rolled in again. It was good timing because Austin Tobin renewed his threat claiming a great swamp was needed and the great swamp was the only place to put it. The great swamp committee, Helen Fenske and the co-workers went after big national donors and they got them. In the spring of 1964, Seward Udall dedicated the refuge, but guess what? Austin Tobin wasn't done. He was like the Terminator. He just kept standing up. Two years after the dedication, Tobin claimed a refuge could coexist with the jet port. After all, there were refuges around other airports. He said that the existing refuge land could be exchanged for land outside the jet port, so 3,000 refuge would still exist. But Austin, it wouldn't be in the Great Swamp. <laughs> Luckily, Lyndon Johnson had signed the Wilderness Act in 1964, the highest form of protection, no man-made structures, no fuel-powered machines. The Great Swamp Committee saw its chance. Peter Freeling Heisen with Helen Fenske at his side led the effort to convince Congress that an area in suburbia could really be a wilderness. They succeeded. In September of 1960, 1968, Johnson signed the Great Swamp Wilderness Act and the fight was over. Austin Tobin lost and the Great Swamp won. And that is all. <laughs> Summit. I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> Okay, I'll be happy to take some questions. Remember, I'm still doing a lot of research. Okay, so as I said, there is the um, movie about the Great Swamp that Scott Morris and Larry Fast did and Cam Cavanaugh's book, Saving the Great Swamp. So be sure you seek these out. So any questions? Oh, yeah. This is just to remind you, Scott Morris's film, new film is out there, American River. Look on um, the PBS listings because it is being shown on various PBS stations. Or you can go to AmericanRiver.film and see where it's showing as well. Okay. All right, so let's see. any questions here? Yeah, it did, but it's a little one. And I don't think they, and they did eventually move it from where it originally was to a place where they could put bigger um, uh, runways, thank you runways in and little jets take off from there but i don't think there was ever enough room to uh, send a big body <laughs> jet off actually in the end as you know a fourth airport was never built that those um commissioned reports from the the towns were absolutely correct they didn't need them bigger better jets came along the um that could use the runways that were already there or that could be ex extended longer. We've never gotten that fourth airport, so mm -hmm. it wasn't needed. Well, one of the things that happened is that um, they need jets that could go like <laughs> out of Europe. That's true. That's true. 
That's true. Mary, Mary Kay mentioned that they also created jets that could go further. So not everybody had to stop here. If you left Chicago, you could get all the way to Europe. You didn't have to start stop at Newark to refuel. That's that's a good point. Yes. Yes. Is the Bakhoven cottage still exists? No, um, you asked if the Bakhoven uh, cottage still exists. It does not. It would have been right where you um, turn the corner from uh, Wood Duck Lane onto Pleasant Plains Road where the gate is. Mm -hmm. It was right there. And my sister and I got to peer into yeah. it at some point and we're just devastated when it was turned down being architecture geeks. Mm -hmm. But um, it was in pretty bad shape and the, the federal government just didn't have the money to do that. They, they're, they're spending their money getting more land and from the time when the great swamp became the great swamp refuge the amount of land that has been added to it is tremendous and it's still getting added there's life tenancy in a number of plots around that as families leave it become there were four i think just this year became parts of the great swamp because of that and it just keeps growing Yeah. That, that's a good question. Mary Kay asked how many more trees do I think there are than there were in when? Well, 1960. Okay, 1960 when it became that. Well, already trees were beginning to grow back even before then mm -hmm. because the farmers were giving up the ghost. They couldn't farm here. So, you know, why maintain your, your ditches and your fields and stuff? So, you see a lot of the young growth that, that you see when you walk down the road here, that wouldn't have been there at that time. So it's it's growing back. So we see a lot of second and third growth trees here now. There's a lot more than there was when it first became a refuge. And of course, we know there's tons more wildlife. Oh, we know there's tons more wildlife. The deer returned, the turkeys returned. The eagles returned. The, eagles returned. the sandhill cranes. <laughs> You guys really have to come walking with us on Fridays. Yeah. Ooh, what we get to see. Yeah. But it, it helps the rest of um, New Jersey too, because when I do Tai Chi near the river, we've seen uh, blue caps fishing. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Mary Kay is re remarking that elsewhere, even outside the swamp, she's seen great blue herons and kingfishers. Yeah. So, yeah. And we have a lot more land around here that's protected. Further up, and you'll learn this if you watch American River, up the river from where we are in uh, down here, it goes through Great Peace Meadows. You probably haven't even heard about it, but this is a huge area of land that has been allowed to remain swamp. And it's being protected the same way this area is. Yeah. So the you know there there is all that landscape for those herons and stuff like that to have their rookeries in. It's good. I'm just going to mention that if you go back in time, the wettest, the driest period was when the Lenape was living here and, and settling in agriculture. Then the colonial period came, and then development started. And as you know, as development, every decade of development causes more water to come here. You think about the rim that encompasses the Great Swamp Basin, all that drainage comes into Great Brook, Meadow Brook, and, and so forth, and comes into this area. And every time you pave the little piece of land, that drainage no longer goes and, you know, infiltrates it, runs right off. And this swamp just gets wetter and wetter as development continues, and it will continue to get wetter. Mm -hmm. Until you know development stops, which I see. Yeah, yeah. Robert's remarking that the development from the it was the, at its driest point when the Lenape Indians were here, and since there's been building around the swamp, every bit of building that goes up increases the runoff into the swamp, and we have really increased the hardscape around the swamp. So it is getting wetter and wetter. And how many times have you gone to drive through the swamp on Long Hill Road? And the bridges are flooded. It gets more and more common. And now with climate change, 
We don't get long, steady mm -hmm. rains as often as we get downpours. Mm -hmm. And long, steady rains can be absorbed and released more readily than a downpour can. So we see flooding more often simply because we're taking up too much of the land. That is a really good point. In the largest oaks here that are all dying of our white oak, which is an upland species in our fields that were left by the farmers and taken over by the pin oaks and also red maples and the swamp white oak, which are now become the main a dominant species because it's getting wetter. Mm -hmm. We're losing our upland. We're losing our upland, yes, and the trees that grew there. And if you look at those uh, white oaks and you realize the age of these, and they are old, old growth because the farmers, that's how they cooled their houses. You planted your house near these giant trees and they acted as your shades during the, during the summer. So whenever you see these giant oaks, you know there was a house there at one point. The other uh, giveaway is daffodils. <laughs> They're at least not as bad as the uh, non-native wisteria. That is monstrous. You know, people just loved wisteria. So they planted it where it would grow and be so beautiful. And now uh, how big are some of those, the extensions under those? Yeah, acres, acres. Yeah, yeah, pretty impressive. You mentioned all the, the dams and the dams. What's the stuff of that? Also, the, the, the civilian conservation tourism on our dams, especially with the fact that we're getting wetter. Is any of that stuff getting into one? Well, um, you were asking, she's asking about the um, dikes and drainage, the dikes and ditches and drainage that were there that the farmers created, and uh, that then uh, the CCC and CWA reinforced. When it became a wilderness over on the eastern side, all of that was simply abandoned. And it's gone, a lot of it's gone back to the way it was. That very straight piece of Black Brook is still very straight. And you, you might have seen lots of little channels in that um, map of the current hydrology. And some of those still existed. But um, I did an interview with um, Bailey Brower, who was a, a Noe descendant a couple of years ago, and he was still irritated <laughs> over the fact that all of those dikes and ditches were simply allowed to fall down after all the work that was done to protect that um, land so uh, it wouldn't get wet. And so a lot of it is just allowed to go away then there are parts of it now, and I'm not familiar with how the hydrology is all run in this part of the swamp now, but there is control over how much water is in one of the impoundments or another one. So some of that is still controlled. I don't know if any of those are the old ditches or not, but, and also I don't know how much cleaning out they do of Great Brook and Black Brook and Primrose or any of those to keep the water moving or if they're pretty much let it go. I don't know the answer to that one. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.